Modern art is generally considered to be less than. Some would even say outright ugly. Some don't consider it art at all, and not without reason. All of these images I'm showing you in this introduction, by the way, are from a New York Times article on the 25 works of art that define the contemporary age. And I'm not even cherry-picking these. This was the first article I got from my first Google search looking for pieces of modern art, and I'm literally showing every result in this article as they are listed. Now before I go any further, I will state that this video is not a critique of modern art generally. There are tons of examples of art created today which are great, or beautiful even. No, this video is more about the implications of the absolute ugliest art that is being made today being held up as the best, even revered as sorts of semi-religious relics in some case. Now why is this? Why are dozens of articles written on the award-winning Petra, a metal and silicone statue of a German policewoman peeing complete with artificial urine, or any of the images shown in that New York Times article, while nobody talks about with the same reverence the very real artistic quality of art produced for things like fantasy novels. I find it hard to believe that were these pieces produced by some big-name artist 200 years ago, that they would not be praised as masterpieces today. Now, some may recognize the inherent ugliness in modern art, and yet still not view this as signifying anything particularly important in itself. After all, they say, art imitates life. So a degradation in the beauty of modern art must simply come downstream of a degradation in society as a whole. Some even like to point out that the modern art period coincides with a major shift in the Western world. That, quote, modern art only began being produced with the decline of Christianity and the beginnings of total warfare on a global scale. These more grim circumstances, they argue, naturally produce art which is darker, more detached, dehumanized and demoralized, and if we want modern art to be fixed, we must first fix modernity itself. And if we look to the ancient world, it seems even to back up this argument. These cultures, and we're typically talking about the Greeks and Romans, produced fantastic works of timeless and universal aesthetic value. We can conclude from this art the various virtues these cultures held most strongly, and therefore how they thought one ought to live. If art is simply downstream of culture, these pieces suggest a strong and moral culture. And indeed, many of these works do come from high periods in the history of these cultures. So while it is undoubtedly true that art imitates life, I think it would be foolish to assume that the reverse isn't also true, that life imitates art. To assume that the art that people come into contact with every day of their lives, including not just in art galleries, but in the architecture they pass every day on their way to work, in the advertising they see on the TV and their phones, to assume that this in no way affects their outlooks and opinions is completely myopic. And yet, to argue that the ugliness of modern art is only a side effect of the ugliness of modernity is to make just that argument. I believe it is self-evident that art profoundly impacts us down to our very cores. It can imbue us with ideas about not just what looks nice, but about what is virtuous, what we ought to do with our lives. Effective art can influence our very foundational ideas of what is beautiful, of course, but also what is good and what is true. Now going forward with the rest of the video, I'd like to explore the consequences of the degradation of modern art using these three concepts of goodness, truth, and beauty. Because, and this is really the main point I would like to get across in this whole video, these three concepts are really all one and the same. There is no meaningful distinction between goodness, truth, and beauty, because you cannot have one without the other two. Let me explain that a bit to make it more clear. I'll begin with the definitions. Truth, as defined by Descartes, is the correspondence of a thought with an object. That is to say, truth, with a lowercase t, is how well a thought or a statement corresponds with the objective underlying reality. So, something can be more or less true, lowercase t, while capital T, truth, is an absolute condition representing an absolute correspondence with reality. Now, goodness, or perhaps the good if you prefer, can be quite difficult, but I'll just define it as that which is beneficial for the individual, but on a deeper level, perhaps something which is beneficial for the soul. And beauty is, of course, just the aesthetic quality of something. Now, as I said, these three concepts are absolutely inextricably linked. 
you cannot have one without the other two. And this is where I differ a bit from the more orthodox assumptions about these virtues, which typically hold that they can exist separately, but that they only achieve their highest value and their highest form when they exist together. I think this just simply cannot be the case. To me, something cannot be, for example, beautiful if it is not also true and good, because beauty is just the word that we use to describe what something which is good and true looks like, at least if we have a well-adjusted conception of what is good, but more on this later. For another example, something cannot be true and not also be good, since that which aligns us and our expectations with the reality of the world, basically that which allows us to live according to nature, as the Stoics would put it, must be of benefit to us or good. And by the way, every such combination of these three virtues are bound up in similar manners. Since these concepts cannot exist alone, it is best really to think of these as three different aspects of a trinity. This trinity doesn't really have a name, but can be defined as describing that which ought to be pursued. Now, if we accept that these aspects of truth, goodness, and beauty are part of this inseparable trinity, ask yourselves, what would be the implications of the existence of a universal or objective beauty? I would actually encourage you to pause the video and come to your own conclusions on this before you proceed. Now, I would say that since something which is beautiful cannot help but be good and true in this formulation, would not this universal objective standard of beauty imply a universal objective standard also of goodness and truth, perhaps even an objective morality? So this is a brief aside, but indulge me for just a minute because I believe there exists a strong argument for the existence of a universal beauty. Let's take for example what all people think are beautiful. We find that there are certain things which are considered beautiful by all cultures across the world and across all times. There are of course things such as landscapes, the night sky, or an old strong looking tree perhaps, which everybody tends to agree are beautiful. But they also find beautiful, and this is important for our discussion on modern art, specific works of art, like those from ancient Greece and Rome. Even tribesmen in remote Indonesian islands, entirely removed from Western or even Eastern civilizations really, judge these to be very beautiful. To take it one step further, could this universal aesthetic not appeal to animals as well? Excluding things that are too complicated for animals to understand, such as operas, movies, or something like that, which would only really be comprehensible to humans, might not animals find the same things beautiful that we do? Charles Darwin, for one, thought that this might be possible, despite being much maligned for having this opinion at the time. He found that his theory of natural selection could not adequately explain seemingly illogical evolutionary developments in animals like the peacock, which developed massive tails which would likely make them easier and slower targets for their predators. Natural selection should select for smaller tails and faster peacocks who could get away from predators more easily, yet this wasn't the case. Darwin accounted for this by developing his theory of sexual selection, wherein animals would choose their mates not strictly on their fitness, but by other factors, including, well, how much they liked their partner's tail feathers. And he could really see no other explanation for why peahens would choose peacocks with larger and more beautiful tail feathers. And so he ended up concluding, We must suppose that peahens admire the peacock's tail as much as we do, even though he was ridiculed for basically arguing that birds can make aesthetic judgments. While this was a somewhat blasphemous theory at the time, I see it as a perfect explanation of not only the development of the peacock's tail, as an explanation for dozens of other animal behaviors which serve no other purpose besides the aesthetic. Take for example the bowerbird, who builds totally impractical nests furnished with moss for comfort and strewn with flower petals which serve no practical purpose. He builds these nests only in order to attract a mate, and this mate must then fly from nest to nest, judging which is the most beautiful before they select their partner. Does this behavior not possibly suggest that these birds are making aesthetic judgments? And while I don't know of any study of the sort, I do wonder what would be the implications of a study which asked humans to rank the bowerbird nests by their attractiveness, and to then compare this to which builders of said nests were the most successful sexually. For another somewhat silly example of the same phenomenon of 
animals seemingly having aesthetic judgments, take a look at this cockatoo dancing to Another One Bites the Dust. You would have to be a very cynical person to assume that this bird isn't getting some sort of enjoyment out of this, that it doesn't like something about the music because of some opinion it holds, however simplistic it may be, about the aesthetic value of this song. And lastly, let's take a look at the Japanese pufferfish and the art that it creates. The male pufferfish spends hours using their bodies to create these mandala-like patterns in the sand, again as part of a mating ritual. The females then have to judge by some criteria which of these mandalas is the best and therefore which partner she will mate with. Now these patterns, I think, must be beautiful to the female pufferfish, and I don't see any reason to assume that the fish finds it beautiful in a way that differs from us. In other words, we both think it's beautiful for the same reasons, whatever those reasons are. Now think back to the question I posed at the beginning of this section. If these animals all judge beauty in the same ways that we do, could this not suggest some sort of universal beauty? And if the concepts of beauty, goodness, and truth are really one different parts of a trinity, could this not suggest a universal good? And if you'll allow me to reach a little bit on this one, if there is a universal good or a universal morality, could this not be a strong point in the favor of the existence of a god? I'm serious here. Given what we know about the nature of beauty, could a pufferfish creating patterns in the sand actually strongly suggest the existence of a god? Perhaps it's a step too far for you, but I do believe that the universal appeal to all humans of classical works of art, as well as the apparent ability to make aesthetic judgments that these animals display, does suggest strongly that our sense of beauty is rooted in an objective foundation based perhaps on underlying colors or shapes or ratios or mathematical formulas, which in turn suggests an objective foundation for what is good and what is true. So now building on our previous sections, if there does exist this objective foundation for truth, goodness, and beauty, or at the very least a strong suggestion of a natural foundation for what we find beautiful, well then modern artists can be seen as guilty of producing art which is not only objectively ugly, but objectively bad and false, and which therefore can be expected to have devastating effects for society. Now, some may try to fall back on the argument that these ugly works of art are, they're not made consciously or maliciously by the artists, rather that they are just expressions of what the artist sees and feels in life, basically trying to argue again that art just imitates life. The biggest problem with this, aside from the fact mentioned above that life is so obviously affected by art, is that the modern artists themselves tell us that the purpose of their art is to demoralize, dehumanize, and to question all of the foundational assumptions of society. This is no deeply held secret of artists, but it's considered more or less the mission statement of all of that art which is called modern or postmodern. Consider these quotes from Picasso and Dali, two giants of modern art. Beauty? To me, it is a word without sense, because I do not know where its meaning comes from, nor where it leads to. If beauty becomes relative, so does goodness and truth. And have we not seen a movement in the modern era towards a world where the only thing that is absolute is relativism? I believe that the moment is near when, by a procedure of active paranoic thought, it will be possible to systematize confusion and to contribute to the total discrediting of the world of reality. A systematically confused populace is a demotivated populace, a populace who will not stand up for what they know instinctively to be right because things are too complicated and it's simply not their place. These artists, who would know better than most the power that art holds over people's minds, intentionally discussing their disregard for beauty and their desires to systematize confusion should wholly discredit the idea that ugly art is benign or unintentional. Ugly art, and the worship thereof, represents an active attempt at the complete demoralization, dehumanization, and destruction of truth and goodness. In this light, ugly art becomes a dangerous and yet vital portent for society. 
When something ugly is created, it is immediately apparent to us, as we react to things which are ugly and off-putting, viscerally and automatically. We cannot help but be naturally averse to things like feces or sexual perversion, and so this instinct serves us well, as it helps us to avoid the evils that come along with those repulsive things. So too with ugly art. Our instinctive revulsion at its appearance helps to guide us morally away from these works which would have the potential to do such evil in our societies. It would be much harder to have an instinctive reaction to the goodness or truth of something, but it is easy and quite natural to react instinctively to something's lack of beauty, and all which lacks beauty necessarily also lacks goodness and truth. The best that can be said in defense of these modern artists is that in a way they do not intentionally create art which is ugly. The problem comes firstly from their hatred of truth and the good, which leads them to see beauty in what is universally considered ugly, and their seeing the ugly as beauty makes them false and evil. These artists, and modernity more generally, worship the ugly not in spite of its lack of beauty, but because of it. <laughs>